congratulations, you have made it to elderhood. You had a childhood, you had an adolescence, you had an adulthood, now you have an elderhood. The concept of elderhood has become more popular among the psychosocial disciplines since the 1990s, but just, just how do you know when you've made it into your elderhood? I'm Larry Grimm, and I'm a personal coach for extraordinary elderhoods, giving you an opportunity to make it the best it possibly can be. But the question is, how do you know when you've made it? Mostly, I, hear, I have been a pastor for many years, and uh, as a pastor, I've worked with congregational members, and I've worked also in chaplaincy, uh, working with long-term care facilities and in hospice care. So I've heard people go through and listened as people have gone through and supported people as they've gone through their, their elderhood. And um, <clears throat> of course, the thing that most often I hear about is the physical dimensions. I got a lot of pains in the joints. I can't do what I used to do. Um, I'm hurting, I'm diseased, I'm having these problems. It's, and oftentimes they're associated with aging, but aging does not create those problems. The problems come at the aging time and the physical dimensions of those are things that we need to address. However, aging is not the only sign of your entry into elderhood. We also have the internal dimensions of life experience, which I'd like to address today. It's, it's that emotional experience. This is the first, uh, the first of my uh, new season of my program, which I'm calling, uh, which I'm calling Don't Just Age, Engage. And um, <clears throat> because I want to enable people like yourself to find a way find the way through the emotional dimensions and into those decision making those decisions that need to be made in order to make this time of your life really extraordinary today i'm going to do an orientation over the entire uh program life that we'll have together my programs will be online here every two weeks starting today and then two weeks from today then uh, Think Tech Hawaii, my wonderful partner in this ministry, Think Tech Hawaii will take a break over the holidays and it will reconvene then in January. So you'll look forward to that time when I'll have more people that will come on and that will talk. We'll do dialogue with them about some of the resources that are available online in particular, uh, some of the uh, dimensions of this experience of aging and uh, ways in which models in which of people who have turned their aging into extraordinary elderhood. Uh, we, we're a vulnerable population, and I include myself. Uh, we're a vulnerable population. We're vulnerable more than just the, more than just the uh, virus right now. We're vulnerable to a, a kind of perspective on aging and a perspective on elderhood that wants to marginalize the elder that takes the, uh, the heart, the experience, the wisdom, and, and the heart of the elder and wants to push it to the side and that's somewhat marginalize it. If we, if we adopt that for ourselves and only see our, our uh, aging process as a physical demise, then we miss out the opportunity of dealing with the with the opportunities which these, these feelings, these emotions give us, once we work through them, we're into a new insight and new dimensions of our aging process or able to make our elderhood extraordinary. And so that's what my coaching is about. And I do it with, with a community, a small community that you can be a part of, a trusted community of people with some of the same issues, some of the same concerns that you have. I do it with... Uh, one-on-one -on -one coaching of desire. And I do it with learning in an academy. And that is a re that's going to be a remarkable opportunity for all of us to, to share insights, to gain wisdom and, and uh, new knowledge uh, of contemporary life, uh, contemporary resources that are available. But today I wanna to focus on that internal dimension. And this sort of sets the pattern for, um, <clears throat> for our, uh, 
for our future as, as this program, Don't Just Age, engage. Uh, I have noticed when I, I was a pastor in Presbyterian churches for many years and uh, worked with people in all stages of life. Um, and uh, I noticed that as people go through different stages, when they accomplish things in those stages, what I call spiritual tasks, then they are freed up to move into the next stage and to enjoy it to its fullest. So I'm very much aware of stage development as we move and grow. I also have noticed when I was in chaplaincy work as a chaplain in long-term care, chaplain in uh, hospice care, and one of the best things that I could do was listen to people tell their stories. I like to think of myself as a professional story listener. And so I uh, welcome those stories and look for those stories because it's not just the events that are important, but the impact of the events in our lives. So I've worked with people in their whole broad range of life experience. And, uh, and now I bring that in this program um, to, to bear on people's needs and interests as they want to shape their elderhood into an extraordinary life. So let me focus now on the five interests, the five spiritual, uh, what I call spiritual disciplines or spiritual tasks that will indicate for you that you have entered your elderhood. The five of them are grieving, sorting, forgiving, preparing, and letting go. The first one that I'd like to focus on is the one grieving. We get to a point in elderhood when we may be surprised that, oh my gosh, I feel so sad sometimes. I feel so forlorn. I feel so sorrowful. And this may be a surprise because we haven't always experienced this, or when we have experienced it, we've done something about it and resolved whatever problem might have presented us with a, a degree of grief. Um, but when we hit our entering elderhood, we find that we are engaging in much more loss than we've ever had before. Now, that loss can be personal loss. I may lose some of my uh, memory, which I've done, and I'm sure comes up frequently. Uh, I may have lost friends and family members. I may have lost a job and a sense of identity. I may have lost a, an opportunity that I wanted to have that, uh, or that didn't uh, come about. Uh, I may have lost what I thought was a future that I wanted to create that now is no longer possible in some way. So there are many kinds of losses that suddenly confront us, not the least of which is our physical, physical problems that can come up. And, um, and, and, but, but that becomes a concern and it comes up to us as grief. I had a pastoral counselor teacher who said to me and to the whole, the whole group that was in his study that the first thing he asked of, of a new counsel or counselee, a new client, was, What are you grieving? What have not, what? Grief is yet to be resolved. Grief is very powerful in our lives. It's very strong. And if we are not resolving those griefs, then we can also we find that they can block us from moving forward and experiencing more joy. Now, sometimes we think of grief as a loss, and it peaks, and then it goes down like that over, over a year. Uh, no, it does not. <laughs> As you know, grief may peak at the time of loss, and then uh, it will decline and then peak again and then decline and peak again at Mother's Day, peak again at Father's Day, peak again at uh, celebrations that come along, the birthdays, the grand uh, family days. Uh, grief can, uh, can dominate your feelings and your emotions uh, because, of it, because it's so strong. And it's always sort of an indication of, oh my gosh, my own life is, is uh, coming towards its end. And that becomes a realization too for us. I like to think of grief though, not as just one feeling. I think grief is more like 
when I go to the laundromat and I'm, I'm finished with my, my washing my clothes and I pull out the clothes out of the washing machine and I throw them in that big dryer and I stand in front of that dryer at the laundromat, put the coins in and it starts churning and churning and it turns over and over and I watch my clothes as they tumble through the wash, through the dry cycle. And, and I think that's what grief is like. It's denial, it's anger, it's hopefulness, it's sadness, it's sorrow, it's, it's um, frustration, it's all these emotions that are tumbling, tumbling around together, and they peak throughout a year in particular, and uh, will peak again at the, end, at the year uh, anniversary. With whom can you share that grief? Family members are not always the best to do that, but sometimes they will, sometimes they can manage it, but oftentimes family members cannot manage it. Sometimes even our spouse cannot manage that some intense grief. So having a community where you can share that, or a person, a counselor, uh, a coach with whom you can share that is a way of, of uh, processing through that tumble action of the many feelings that are go along with grief. So first thing, we're aware in our elderhood that we grieve more than we grieved before in our lives. The second spiritual uh, task that we have in our elderhood is sorting. And I say it's sorting out our stories. And now, all of us get to a point where we start sorting out our stuff. We sort out our stuff. Um, we decide which what stuff goes to whom. Who do we want to inherit this? How do we want to pass this along to uh, maybe the Salvation Army or pass this along to Goodwill? Or we, we sort out our stuff. And how oftentimes have you heard, oh my gosh, or said to yourself, oh my gosh, I never knew how much stuff I had. Well, we do sort out our stuff. But what do you do when you sort out your stuff? When you make those decisions, I maintain that most of the stuff has a story behind it. And when we sort out our stuff, we're really sorting out those stories and the significance of the events that they represent. Now, I, like I said, I consider myself a professional story listener. And oftentimes patients and, and people with whom I've worked have had one or two or three stories that they really like to tell about themselves, about their past. And it'll be the same story and they will tell it again and again. And I am, I have done that myself with certain stories. I have a story about, about the birth of my second daughter uh, when I was present to help give birth to my, my second daughter. And I can tell that story. And when I tell the story, it's, as it is for everyone, the experience of that past event, the emotions of that past event come into the very present of my telling the story. And so as I tell that story, I relive that experience and reincorporate it into my heart and mind. In, in uh, Greek, it's called anamnesis. In remembrance, we say. And that remembrance time is a way of recalling what the power of that event into the present. This is who we are. This is who I am. This is who you are when you tell that story. And, the, and it is from the past, but it is very much a part of who you are in the present. So we're very careful about letting go of some of those stories because they are about events that shape us into the person that we continue to be in our elderhood. Hold height to those stories. And uh, sometimes it's a need to process something that's unresolved. Sometimes, again, it's just a way of saying, this is who I am and what I cherish in my life. The third uh, spiritual task that we have that peaks up and arises within our consciousness from those five tasks is is forgiving. We have a need to forget. Now, this is not in response to some religious imperative, that some commandment of forgiveness, but it actually comes up 
has a desire, a genuine desire that may surprise us again, a desire to forgive or a desire to be forgiven. And, uh, and this road ahead, we're going from grieving, sorting stories to forgiving. And the act of forgiving is different from the act of reconciliation. <clears throat> Reconciliation occurs when two or more people want to rebuild the relationship. That's what recounsel means, to re, re, rebuild a friendship, to come back together, to reunite. And if it's not a, if it's not a motiv motivation of all the parties involved, there certainly will be, not be any reconciliation. Now, forgiveness will be part of that reconciling act. I think in, in uh, Hawaiian, ho'oponopono is the term. And when we forgive one another, we, and when we want to reconcile, we, we do need to forgive self and forgive one another in order for that goodness to be restored in the relationship. But it is different from forgiveness because we can enact forgiveness on our own, unilaterally. Ricky was a young man in uh, hospice care. He had, had um, AIDS and the, he lost the bottom half of his right leg to AIDS. Was a, a fairly large man, like almost my size. And then he was, became fairly, just was emaciated from the disease that he had. And he was in his late forties. So he wasn't, a, a, he was not a, a, a his body was still still could have been was still strong in some ways, but the AIDS of course decimated him. And um, <clears throat> we had a good trusting relationship. So I was in his room one day, and Ricky just suddenly said, "Pastor, I need to repent." And I said, "Okay, we can do that. Is this a, is this a general repentance, or is this about some specific event in your life?" And Ricky said, it's specific. And I said, okay. And does it involve a woman? And he said, yes. So Ricky, I wanted, I said to Ricky, now imagine that she is standing at the foot of your bed and looking at you right now. You see her there? Yeah. Okay, now tell her, and you can speak it if you want, or you can just in your mind do this. Tell her what you want her her to hear from you at this time. And there was a silence, just a casual, I mean, a comfortable silence. And I could see he was thinking. And then finally he said, please forgive me. And I said, is that all you want to say? And he said, yeah. And I said, okay, now go to the foot of your bed in your imagination. You'd be her. Stand there. Stand there where she was and look back at yourself in the bed. Do you see yourself, Ricky? Yeah. Now, as her, respond to what you just told her. And again, there's some silence. And then he said, Ricky, I forgive you. And then I said, come back into the bed, Ricky. So imagination, he came back into the bed, and I said, uh, how are you feeling now? And he took his arms like this, and said, like a, like a load's been lifted off of my back, lifted off of my shoulder. We did one more of those, I think, and then three days later, he died. That's a, an extreme example, but it nonetheless is that uh, expression that there is a desire to forgive, to clean one's conscience, to, uh, to extend forgiveness to others, to receive forgiveness from others, and to receive forgiveness from ourselves. It truly is a liberating experience, and we can exercise forgiveness when we recognize that that's something it's pressing on us, and that's where the help of others come in to help us recognize that, and that we can exercise that forgiveness. For Ricky, it was an inter-psyche in his own psyche uh, that he was wrestling with, and he resolved it. 
and it gave him a peace in his passing. So uh, back to our five, our five spiritual tasks in elderhood. <clears throat> we notice that we grieve. We notice that we um, are doing more sorting of our stories. We notice that we have a desire to cleanse the conscience, to enact forgiveness. We find ourselves preparing, preparing. Uh, one of my dear friends said to me, when I crossed 70, I began to ask the question, when, where, and how? He was referring, of course, to his own dying. When, where, and how? And these are, are critical questions in, in terms of preparing externally. You know, we, we, there are so many resources available for us to to wrestle with and address um, the uh, externals of our elderhood. For instance, um, <clears throat> for instance, uh, uh, social workers are great resources for us at, when we become a case, uh, part of their case work, to provide with us with um, uh, an idea of how to fund a place to live. That's the most expensive thing uh, about elderhood, uh, especially as we move closer and closer to end of life, however that may come, when, where, and how. Um, <clears throat> we can uh, think of, though, also in terms of last will and testament, have we prepared that? Have we prepared for, uh, advanced directives? Especially important in our day and age when there's so much that surprises us at this stage of life and can uh, take over our dying process that um, just can be sudden. Of course, COVID virus is much on our mind, of everybody's mind now. To contract that for, for so many has been a way of just suddenly going into, into decline and suddenly into dying. So thinking about that ahead of time, when you're well, when you're strong, when you are able to marshal the resources to do conversation with family members and say, here's what I want, and I would like for you to go along with that for me. All of that is very, very important to do when we have that consciousness and strength to do it. So that's the external preparations. There are also some internal preparations. Um, imagining what life beyond life is alike. Um, <clears throat> when I have worked with people in uh, Alzheimer's, we have often spent much time. I often spend a lot of time with music. I sing, sing to them, and I encourage them to sing. And one of my groups that I had, an Alzheimer's group, got well, they spent a lot of time singing the old songs from the good old songs from their uh, faith from their childhood. And many of those songs I noticed had and these beautiful images of life after life. And we would, it was a way of them preparing for the life beyond life that was to be theirs. That's how they imagined it. That's how they prepared for it. They got themselves mentally ready to receive what they thought would be a gift in the new life. So preparing is very important. And again, to be done with, with friends, to be done with family, to be done with coach. Finally, letting go is the fifth. The fifth indicator that you have, you have entered your elderhood. And the most extreme case, letting go occurs, of course, at our last breath, at our last dying. In hospice care, when I was walking uh, in, a, in my uh, hospice facility and a, a young woman came out of the room and said, uh, gosh, chaplain, you know, we're in there with mom and mom's just so strong. She just, she won't let go. And my thought was, yeah, I don't blame her. <laughs> Letting go is probably the hardest thing that we ever do. Uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross in the 70s who gave us the five stages of dying, indicated that uh, I'm, I'm brought to mind for me a, a good memory, which is when I'm 
have a, a member, family member dying or somebody that I love dying, I'm losing that person. That person is losing everything. Everything, everyone, everything that has ever brought meaning into their life, they are losing it and they know they're losing it. And so they don't want to let go. Who wants to let go at that point? It seems like you're stepping off into oblivion. Alan Watts said, you have to prepare in order to fall asleep and never to wake up again. Perhaps that's what dying is. Uh, different religions and different orientations have different visions of life beyond life and also uh, and how, they, how we envision that may affect the way in which we are able to let go. I have uh, coached dying people in letting go and surrendering to that process because the body knows what it has to do. The body does it on its own. And we really kind of come alongside the body psychologically and, and cooperate with our body. A new life, in my opinion, is being born. And that's part of the mystery and wonder of the dying process. But letting go is something that we do very much throughout life. And when you surrender something, when you let go, part of a grieving experience is to let go. And having a community with which you can share that letting go process and learn from it will really enhance and make extraordinary your elderhood. Well, these are the five spiritual tasks of elderhood. We're going to look at these more specifically in the future. If you'd like to go to my website, um, my website is, is uh, personalcoachingforlifeandfaith.com. And when you arrive there, this is what you will see. And on the left-hand side, you can pick and choose some, some places to look and explore. Uh, there are three main areas. There's elder guilds, small group. There's one-on-one -on -one coaching. And there is an elder academy available. And then at the bottom, you'll see you can also push it, purchase my new book, which I've recently published. Don't just age, engage personal coaching for your extraordinary elderhood. I look forward to seeing you in two weeks. Come bring some comments, questions, and, uh, and we'll pursue this. How do you know you're in your elderhood? You've got five spiritual tasks to pay attention to. They will demand your attention. Thanks so much. Aloha.